Sid, hello. Hey, Tiago. How are you doing? Again. We uh, So this is our second attempt recording this podcast. We've already recorded this once, and it all went horribly wrong. We had some technical glitch, which meant that it never recorded. So uh, we're going to give it another go. <laughs> yeah. So if you feel we're not doing this with as much feeling as we should, that's probably why. We'll try and inject some gusto to it this time, make it even better. Indeed. Quite. <laughs> second time's the charm, right? Right. Sid, introduce us. What are we talking about? So... We decided to have this um, episode focus on the article by Nick Carter, which I think is quite relevant in the current state of affairs of what's happening in the US and even the UK for that matter. And it's called Operation Choke Point 2.0 is underway. And crypto is in its crosshairs by Nick Carter. So shall we shall we walk talk through what the article talks about then? Uh, yeah, sure. So why don't we start off with uh, what Operation Choke Point was initially? Yeah, so what was it? So uh, o- Operation Choke Point was a name given to uh, a program carried out by the Department of Justice under President Obama. It was a, a clandestine operation that had no accountability. Um, the name was coined by uh, Frank Keaton in an op-ed in, uh, in The Hill back in 2018. And Essentially, what it was is the OCC and the FDIC threatened banks with more regulation if they didn't comply with their demands. But the the nefarious bit in all this was that it was all done underground. Uh, it was all done without Congress, without any laws being passed. And all that happened was the Fed officials were putting pressure on banks to close business accounts of lawful companies but based solely on ide- ideology so in areas that uh, the the administration just didn't agree with ideologically so what what sort of what what do you mean by if they didn't comply what was what were they looking at in that terms well they they were basically asking them to close down the, the accounts of these these companies and i mean at one point uh, the FDIC had a list of over 30 different industries, not companies, industries wow. uh, that, that they wanted the banks to avoid. So some examples were like the, the gun and ammunition manufacturers, uh, online poker, adult industry, payday loans, um, that, that kind of thing. Anything the administration didn't like. But rather than doing it officially and uh, having some due process around it and actually getting laws passed, it was all just done on the sly. Yeah, yeah. Okay, fair enough. That's an easy shortcut, isn't it, to bypass the whole democratic process? Well, it is, but I mean, it. it you know, the, the United States isn't or wasn't or, well, however you want to see it, shouldn't be a banana republic, right? No, quite. I mean, it's meant to be this shining beacon of democracy and meritocracy. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and choke point 1.0 uh, ran counter to everything to do with the principles of due process and fairness that allegedly the United States is all about. Yeah. Wasn't uh, wasn't it uh, true that in one of the cases, uh, the FIDIC met the bank chairman and suggested that he would face criminal charges if he didn't terminate the bank's relationship with the payday lender? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, that's one of the stories yeah. that came out. Um, so th- this carried on till 2017, didn't it? And then it sort of stopped. Yeah. Yeah, Trump ended it, didn't he? Yeah, but w- the problem was the harm had been done and obviously the stigma still remained. So if if the banks had already been told not to interact with certain industries, they weren't going to rush back into their arms just because the government said so now, because so you never know when the government changes and therefore the mood changes in, in um, White House. Yeah, I mean, to this day, um, certain industries still have trouble getting banking relationships because... It's just not worth the extra risk yeah. for the banks, right? They just want a quiet life. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting how the weaponization of money has taken place. I mean, at every stage you see, it's basically you hit the pocketbooks first. So if you just take money out of the equation from the industries or companies or governments or individuals you don't like, you, you're effectively, I mean, I can I like the title choke point given to it because it's exactly that. Yeah, I think, though, you can only do it so long before people get fed up and look for alternatives. Yeah, I mean, but Canada did it with the truckers. Um, uh, the West has done it with Russia, with their sovereign uh, money. And uh, obviously, Obama did it with these industries. So, yeah, the precedent is there. How long it'll carry on will be interesting. 
It will. But I mean, I, I, you could make the argument that, you know, the events we've seen in the past week or so, uh, past couple of weeks, um, will probably precipitate that. I mean, there's going to be people on the margin that have heard of Bitcoin. They've done a bit of research, but they just weren't quite there. They weren't quite ready. And they'll have woken up, you know, uh, when uh, Silvergate or Silicon Valley Bank shuttered. And over that weekend, they won't have known if they were going to have access to their money the next day. And I think that's going to wake in people's eyes. It's going to make the the Bitcoin argument easier. It's less theoretical, I think, isn't it? And they might not put all of their money in it, but, you know, maybe put a few percentage in, right? Yeah, or at and least, maybe... as you said, become aware of it. Yeah, okay. And you're yeah, correct. And... And I think the volatility is a price that maybe is worth paying in order to ensure access to funds. It's actually flipped it, hasn't it, on its head, really. You, you're, you're looking at 24-hour liquidity in the Bitcoin space. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's just having access to any capital when the time comes, any capital, even if it is not all your capital. Yeah, I mean, just even if it's just to make payroll, yeah. right? You know, there were companies putting out emails saying we're not going to be able to make payroll next week if if the bank, the government doesn't step in. Yeah, shocking, really. Let's talk about Nick Carter's article then, shall we? We've given sort of a background, yeah. haven't we? Yeah, so yeah, uh, let's move on to show point two point zero then. So uh, this all started, I guess, it had its roots when the Biden administration came in. Um, they very swiftly reversed what was known as the fair access rule. Uh, that the Trump administration had brought in. And the fair access rule just prohibited political discrimination um, in financial uh, affairs. Now, they seem to have learned their lessons. So the problem with the problem that ended up shutting choke point one down was the fact that the guidance was all informal. It was backdoor conversations. Everything was off the record. Um, and this is what the Republicans used in order to shut it down because they said that the, the program was unconstitutional, which it obviously was. So choke point two, they appear to have learned their lesson. And this time it's all above board. Uh, semi-legal, you mean? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah semi-legal. Um, but they're doing it in the form of guidance and blog posts. And they're talking about this safety and soundness risks. That's yeah. the latest buzzword from Washington, isn't it? Everything's about safety and soundness. Of course. Sounds yeah. really, sounds do you, really by good. By the way, do you subscribe to Fed's blog post? Love it. Yeah, Never great, isn't it? Great episode. content. Yeah, every day. It's riveting. It puts me to sleep every night. <laughs> um, but uh, I like J Jake Chervinsky uh, uh, refers to it as regulation by blog post. And that's exactly what it is, right? Yeah. Uh, and it just boils down to this whole thing of it's so much easier to do that and you don't have to go through all the official regulatory process of getting congress to change the laws and uh and do all that why would you do that if you can just write a blog post and dissuade a bank by of, of banking crypto by just saying well you know if you have any exposure to crypto uh we're gonna have to look very closely at you yeah you know most banks are just gonna go you know what it's just not working. exactly nobody wants to get into uh, trouble do they yeah. yeah, quite, quite. And and I think that's the key because they found a way now that they just don't, I mean, I, I don't know if they, where this goes, whether it goes into a point where the new laws will never need to be passed and you can just affect change in behavior. We sort of saw it with COVID as well, didn't we? People's behaviors were affected just by guidance, so to speak. Well, I think uh, I think a lot of that is going to hinge on on the next six months and and what comes out. So Caitlin Long, who's with with Custodia Bank, she's been hinting very strongly that they have strong evidence yeah. that there has been collusion in Washington and that what they did was highly illegal, um, and they're going to court over it, I believe. So, um, and she said, "Watch this space," didn't she? Yeah, so I think look, let's see what comes out of that. But I, I agree. If if they get away with this, I think it's uh, very bad news. Yeah, very bad. Awful, news. awful. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, it's it's. I think it's a game changer the way they are managing to use money so effectively, uh, and and sort of create a semi legal guidance on blog post while still appearing transparent, and then making sure that their agenda gets followed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. This all came about, so pre the FTX collapse, none of the regulators were interested, yeah. right? No, nobody was interested in it, despite having been warned by people like Caitlin that there was a high, highly likely suspicious activity yeah. going on, and nobody did a thing. And then when FTX collapsed, um, they took a long, hard look at this, and they've decided that their golden goose is the on-ramps and the off-ramps. So they decided if they could go and kill the on- and off-ramps in the US, 
they could regulate crypto indirectly effectively yeah yeah and i think i think that's always been the risk i've always feared that i don't think so the go- governments across the world will be able to put a ban on crypto per se because they're going to struggle to sort of put the genie back in the bottle but what they can do is make it really really difficult so that the roads leading up to crypto industry are um, pitted with potholes and and barriers you know just reduce create friction points yeah and i think um it's going to be very interesting to see going forward i mean so we've lost silvergate uh, silicon valley bank and signature yeah. right they're the three main banks that were banking crypto yeah. in the us so when the dust settles over the next few weeks, assuming it does, and we don't go into another round of high emotion, um, it'll be interesting to see how unbanked the industry is. You know, is this actually going to have a material effect? Is this going to affect the big companies in the US and the small startups? Or are they going to find banks that will will um, bank them or not? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I was reading the other day, interestingly, a huge number of uh, companies in India, for that matter, which is a, has a big startup scene, were banked with um, SVB, a Silicon Valley bank. So they've lost a lot of money there as well. So you just don't know. The ripple effects don't just uh, stop in Silicon Valley. No, and apparently, I mean, the, the VCs were saying to the founders, they were backing this, and you've got a bank with um, with Silicon Valley. And so everybody ended up banking there. And there's an there's a there's an interesting take on it on why that was the case. Uh, the VCs pushed their companies that they were investing in the to bank with Silver uh, Silicon Valley Bank because then they said we could see all your transactions. We've got transparency. We know exactly what's coming in, what profits you're making, and what's going on. So that was sort of in a funny sort of way created to create more transparency. But obviously, it uh, centralized all the risk. Yeah. And the, the breathtaking thing about uh, Silicon Valley Bank was the speed at which it closed, yeah. right? I mean, it basically went from hero to zero in 48 hours. I think they saw an outflow of $46 billion in one day. The previous record, I think, was $12 billion. And, you know, the bank runs can just happen so much quickly. Sorry, so much more quickly now because of the internet yeah. right? and the communication so quick and now you don't even need to go down to your local branch to transfer 10 million out you just go onto your computer yeah, everybody there. jumps runs to the laptop to get money out yeah, and and why would you not right yeah of course because it, 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 ultimately it, all these banks are fractionally reserved yeah. so if there's any chance that this thing is going down you of course you're incentivized to go get your money out it's funny i went for a walk this morning with a friend of mine who used to be ex-lehman and he was telling me how it all um how it all panned out and he said, it's it's nothing happens, nothing happens. You can see slight motions going on, rum, rumblings of things not being right going on, but it doesn't seem anywhere catastrophic. And then right in front of your eyes, just overnight, big explosion, bang, everything's gone. And he says he's seen it so many times in this industry. It's like you just don't appreciate how quickly these things happen when they happen, as he said. Yeah, and it's happening faster and faster. And when they bring in Fed now, which they're bringing in, it's going to be 24-7 liquidity. Um, I think, I'm, I'm not sure if it's instant settlement, but it's very quick settlement. The Fed now, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that'll be interesting. Well, there's few few light years behind the rest of the world because this has been implemented in Europe. It's been implemented in Asia as well. I think India has been doing it for a while. There are a couple of other countries that have been doing it successfully for a long time. So, But it will mean that in order to stop these well, they should, in order to stop these bank runs, have to have a higher reserve requirement just because it's it's even quicker to get your money yeah. out. On the plus side, though, the only thing I was thinking was that the whole ethos behind having Silvergate and Signature Banks being the go-to places for crypto was that it was 24-7 settlement, right? So you could, you yeah. could trade on the weekend. So maybe with Fed now, obviously, depending upon whether the banks are allowed to trade crypto, um, or have access to crypto companies, maybe that will sort of create a bit more stable access in terms of you're not then link- limited to one or two places only. Um, and people can have... So with, as we said, with Silvergate, all the companies had to be an, a depositor with Silvergate in order to have 24-7 settlement with each other. Yeah. So maybe yeah. with the Fed now, you might have the ability to decentralize it a little bit and still have the 24-7 settlement. I don't know. Maybe. 
maybe. And I thought it was very interesting to see. So this choke point 2.0 really now on steroids, because I, I don't know if you saw, but the F FDIC has moved into uh, Signature and they're looking for uh, a, a firm to come over and, and, and buy it out. And I don't know if you saw the requirements, no. but uh, the requirements are they have to have a bank charter and they have to renounce any uh, crypto exposure of uh, of Silvergate Bank. So once again, they've come in and they said, you can come buy it, but you have to be a bank and you have to shut down all crypto accounts. Well, where is that in the law? So you're saying you know, there's no political uh, political targeting of crypto industry then? <laughs> well, um, you know, again, let's watch Caitlin very closely, but yeah. uh, she's insistent that they have proof. Interesting. Not necessarily proof, I don't think, but they, they have been told by Washington who's, who's orchestrating this. And it's all coming from the Biden White House. Yeah. Yeah, it's the the Biden uh, appointees at the top of these agencies yeah. that are coordinating everything. Uh, so yeah, so back to the article. I mean, Nick goes on to say that what's happened is that labeling these crypto facing banks as high risk has had four direct effects on them. One is it raises the FDIC premium. premium. Uh, two, it lowers the cap rate with the Fed. That means they can withdraw less money in case they need it. Uh, Third is it faces, they face the bank space restriction on their other business activities. And finally, the management um, risks a poor examination score, which therefore goes on to inhibit their ability for mergers and acquisition and other deal making that may, they might want to do. So, I mean, the, the effects are quite pronounced for the normal functioning of a bank uh, by just calling, labeling them as high risk. Yeah, so if if a bank decides to serve as crypto firms, they end up getting completely handicapped quite, to their yeah. competitors. Yeah, and I think Custodia was quite. She was Caitlin Long was quite um, clear about it, wasn't she? I know more information is due to come out, but historically, so far, she said that it was definitely a targeted attempt to sh make sure Custodia did not succeed. And it was ironic that literally a week after her license was uh, rejected, that. Fed came up with exactly the issues that she had raised were going to bring banks down as the issues that caused the other banks to fail. But at the same time, even though she complied with everything uh, more than required, uh, they still continue to reject her license. But the thing is, and I, I think Caitlin herself has, has spoken about this, the problem with a bank like Custodia is it could end up breaking the system, right? Because in a time like this, right, let's say things get a bit frisky with the fractional reserve bankings, everybody, and I mean everybody's going to pile their money into a bank like Custodia. Yeah. There's going to be nothing left. Why would you Why would you put your money anywhere else? If you've got a safe storage, a safe uh, haven for just access to your bank um, balance, then you choose a bank that's not playing silly buggers with your money, basically. You know? and, and at the moment, there is, there is no bank that, that, yeah. that does that, right? But if Custodia right. was allowed, there would be. And yeah. that would have interesting, you know, second effects. Yeah, um, it would completely um, put the fractional ownership in harm's way. Which could cause, ironically, great instability, potentially. Yeah, yeah it's the problem, isn't it? I think that's, but the thing is, that's what they use, right, as a tool to to make sure that regulation change doesn't take place. They keep pumping good money after bad because they know if they try to change the system, it's going to lead to instability. Yeah. But look, I, I really hope that uh, Custodia succeeds, but I, I, I can't help but feel that any strategy where you have to request permission from the corrupt old guard is probably doomed to failure. Yeah. I think... Um, so and and of course, just to go back to your um, your points there about how they're directly affected, uh, should they service crypto companies, you know how they're handicapped. The the irony in all this, of course, is that the banks haven't failed because of crypto, right? No. It's on the contrary. The banks failed because they invested poorly. So Silicon Valley Bank had huge inflows a few years ago. I think they doubled their book in, in a very short space of time. And yeah. the way banks work is they've got to lend that out and they've got to create um, they've got to create return on that. But they had so much money coming in um, that they just didn't have time to do that. So what they did was they invested in, in long duration treasuries. And of course, they put a massive amount into those when in a in a market whereby the interest rates were going up. And so then when people did want their money out of the bank, 
they had to sell their treasuries at a huge loss. They ended up with a huge hole. So it wasn't actually because of crypto that these banks failed. No, it's it's basic uh, um, investing 101, and that's where they failed. I mean, this is a base. This is the bread and butter stuff for any chief risk officer. That's what gob, um, gobsmacked at. How well, did the CRO wasn't Silicon Valley Bank chief risk officer out promoting a lesbian visibility day or something? Well, I hope it went well for her because the point of the matter is this is the absolute basic stuff that you have to have to be on top of. If you see that you've got a huge exposure to a bond portfolio, interest rates are going up. That means your bond portfolio is getting cheaper and cheaper. I mean, surely there's got to be some way of hedging against this. They, they essentially, they, they listen to the Fed forward guidance. And of course, the Fed forward guidance said that they expected- You mean the blogs, right? <laughs> they, well, and so they, they, the Fed forward guidance, first of all, has never been right, ever in the history of forward guidance has ever been right. But anyway, so the Fed forward guidance was suggesting that uh, interest rates weren't going to go above 1%. So they've just taken that as gospel by the looks of it. But they never, they never protected themselves. They never hedged it, right? Yeah, I think, I think uh, honestly, I mean, the, there's there's definitely a the blame lies also on the bank itself. I'm not letting them get away damage free out of this. I mean, obviously they no they don't exist anymore. But the point of the matter is that they have they have something to answer for, and this is something they should have been aware of and on top of uh, equally as well. But this is a great great opportunity for the politicians to go in and dunk on crypto, right? Yeah, of course they will. But I think as it's becoming, I think last week was a lot about crypto, crypto, crypto exposure. But this week, I think people are realizing that it has let it had less to do with crypto and more to do with just the way the banks are functioning. And that's the good news that's come out of it. I'm pleased it's happened so quickly after they came down hard on crypto banking, because it shows that people can see the two together next to each other and see where actually the truth lies. Well, I hope so, right? I, I hope this is a learning opportunity. And um, in a way, it's a shame that they've all got their money back because I think, uh, you know, nothing teaches you faster than losing your money, right? Um, but I, I think this will be an opportunity for Bitcoin, like I said earlier. Um, let's see let's see what comes of it. Let's see what comes of it. Well, uh, the way I look at it also is that it doesn't matter what the... Uh, yes, America is a big market. And yes, they're coming down hard on Bitcoin and crypto banking and what have you. But if they think they've can, they can uh, contain this, they are living in la-la land because there'll be another jurisdiction. And I think that's what Nick Carter says at the end of his article as well. All it's going to do is going to push this to different countries outside the US jurisdiction and they'll take up may, maybe a much more... Um, favorable look towards crypto market already. Uh, Hong Kong is doing it, which was completely, I mean, China banned Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining of, uh, last year. And here they are uh, saying, no, 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 we're going to be the hub of uh, crypto finance. Uh, UK is trying to do the same thing. They're talking about Bitcoin and all the other nonsense that goes with it, but they want to be a hub for crypto because after Brexit, surprise, surprise, a lot of the financial market and the industry, which was based out of London, has moved. You know, so these countries that are struggling will improvise, and uh, the jurisdiction people will just move. And and the irony is, the U.S. is so scared of losing control that by doing this, they're going to lose control. They're going to increase risk. They're yeah. going to lose market share. And like you say, it's just all going to go offshore because yeah. of this. Yeah. But I I hope it it wakes people up. I think sometimes in the West. I think although we have huge problems in the financial sector and, and banking, um, I think it works well enough generally for people not to bother doing a deep dive into this. But I think you concentrate your mind when you get a call saying you might not get access to your money on Monday morning. The other thing that's, that was interesting to watch was watching the VCs just melt down over that weekend, right? You Jason yeah. Calacanis online in all caps on Twitter saying, you know, buy guns. This is outrageous. You know, uh, the government has to step in and give us our money back. Otherwise, it's the end of the world kind of thing. And I think um, Bitcoiners, Bitcoiners are much more schooled in this way things because there's no bailouts in Bitcoin land, right? And I think uh, I think Bitcoin are Bitcoiners are generally way ahead of the general public on this kind of thing because they've learned their lessons. Unfortunately, it's a lesson that has to be relearned every every cycle because you've newcomers yeah. coming in. But you know, the people have lost money in Mt. Gox, right? They don't of leave their coins on exchanges anymore. Yeah, you know, you get you get burned once, you're not going to get burned twice. 
Well, I don't think so. There are many Bitcoiners who've got any fingerprints left on their uh, fingers. I mean, yeah. they weren't. They, once you realize it, you've got scar tissue there and you just say, fine, you know, until the next one happens. But the point is with the banks, it's the same thing over and over again. It is. It is. I just hope it's a bit of a wake up call for some yeah. people. But I think what Nick Carter makes a really good point, and he, he made this article, wrote this article a few weeks before this whole thing kicked off. And he makes a really good point is that it's not it's not subtle anymore. It's not hidden. It's open now. And they're coming after crypto industry, coming after the off and on ramps. Why is the, I think, to be dis debated in, in a future episode? But for now, the fact that they are coming after it is pretty, pretty obvious. Yeah, it's a concerted, coordinated effort. Yeah, by the Biden administration, you know, yeah. you, you never know. Maybe we we'll get lucky, and maybe we get a young Republican in next next time round. Maybe DeSantis or something. Um, but I think whilst Biden's there, it's going to be difficult. Yeah, I think I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. But the only thing that sort of makes me chuckle a little bit is that even if it if they keep going harder and harder, they'll realize that they're going to break other things. It's a bit like a bull in a china shop. You might be aiming for that teacup, but you're going to take down a lot more than just that teacup. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I know we may have gone a little off off piece to here today, but um, there's just so much going on. You know, it's hard not to talk about it as well. Yeah. But um, is there anything else about the article, Sid, that uh, we need to cover, do you think? No, I don't think so. I think uh, the main points were covered. And I think to get the real taste of the article, it's best to go read it. It's not... It's not uh, very complicated or too long. It's quite a nice, well-written article by Nick Carter, and I would really suggest you go read that. And if if you've got time, also have a look at the article, the original choke point article by Frank Keaton um, uh, in the Hill, and we'll put the put the links in the show notes. Yeah, for sure. So big shout out to Nick. He's got some good stuff out there. He is, yeah. And um, yeah, no, all good. Cool. Well, until next time. Thanks for listening. Cheers.